So here's my agenda for today. Uh, we'll start off from just talking about what is Crypto Econ Lab and its network, what are we set out to do. I hope after this talk, people have a good idea of like, oh, what's our, what our region are, what are the different areas that we are working on. And then we, we talk about the key economic policy on Filecoin so that we all have a baseline understanding of how Filecoin works before the rest of the talk today. And then lastly, uh, I will give an update on like, the sale of the Filecoin network and also we talk about the other uh, future Crypto Econ days. Cool, before we start, just a bit of a history lesson. Fun fact, uh, much of Filecoin crypto econ was actually simulated in Austin before we launched. So super glad to be back here again uh, in, in Austin. Cool, let's dive in. So um, at Crypto Econ Lab, we kind of think about all the crypto uh, projects and blockchain as like economic networks. So we kind of define this process of um, design, validation, deployment, and governance, right? So I, I need to figure out, oh, what should, how should I design this? How do I know my design is good, right? And, and, how, and, and once we design it, how do we deploy it, right? And after we deploy it, our job is not done. We need to analyze with analytics and try to understand how we govern such a living system, right? And we aspire to be the industry leader, industry defining leader in this uh, whole process. And our vision really to, is really to build an end-to-end R&D lab that starts from research, protocol, and then to product and ecosystem. And uh, people talk about crypto econ a lot. It's really, um, this diagram here really illustrate the interdisciplinary nature of the space. And we also take part in our um, team culture. So if all these things speak to you, reach out to us. Uh, we can talk more um, after, during the break or after our presentations. And um, so this is another illustration of like this whole process, right? So we have like upstream research, uh, more general incentive. Uh, all the way to like, and with an upcoming protocol, new incentive, and then the protocol governance, and then like uh, analytics and ecosystem. We do believe that um, the success of the, uh, the ecosystem is so vital to the success of the economy. So like another illustration here, more like a bird's eye view, we work with different upstream organization, and then we also actively participate in the ecosystem. And then given this kind of scope, um, end-to-end R&D, we are hiring across the board for different roles, uh, few, um, uh, research, product, engineering, uh, anything. And if there's anything that doesn't fit your role, just reach out to us and then we, I'm sure we can define something. I think there's enough um, ideas, space, capital, and uh, things for everyone to like work on in our ecosystem. And cool, so now I want to talk about a bit more about the two uh, main mandate or two main kind of areas of focus of our lab. One is more on the research, uh, analytics, and governance side, which will make up, I think, like the first half of today's uh, talk. Each of the speakers will, uh, will go more in depth. And then the second part will be more on like the business and application that can get built on the Falcon ecosystem. So on the research and data-driven governance side, uh, a lot of that really is that no one can really predict the future, right? Like we kind of like, but we, we, but we can apply some kind of scientific method trying to understand the system dynamics and trying to understand incentive forces that are pushing the system, right? So then we can have some kind of reasonable understanding of what the trajectory might be. And uh, so uh, we kind of start, we kind of define this process of um, analytics and monitoring so that we know what's going on, we get very frequent feedback, and then if there's new question, we can do like modeling, we do similar um, project forward. And then um, to kind of really affect all those changes, we rely on the FIP process, which uh, kind of uh, which is similar to EIP, uh, the EIP process on Ethereum, which stands for Filecoin Improvement Protocol, right? And this is really iterative, and there are many dimensions to the data on Filecoin, given it's a complex economy. We also talk about what is Filecoin in a moment. Um, so just some example of the stuff that we work on. On the analytics side, we look at protocol uh, level. So like, what about the gas? What about the blocks? And are we like, uh, is everything looking healthy? More so from like a blockchain protocol layer. Then we also look at the macro economy. How is the Filecoin economy doing today, right? Like where there's also analytics in that uh, aspect. And what about the different actor behaviors, right? What's the risk tolerance level and, and what is like all this implied um, kind of perception of the system? Is everybody super bullish about the Filecoin network? And then we also look into like value flows from your um, token transfer to who, who did you make deals with and so on and so forth and the data flows as well. Um, and then we also work on FIP, uh, which is we mentioned earlier. So this covers three different aspects. It could be ideation, right? Like, oh, we want to make some changes to the protocol. 
what are some new fib or new changes that we can introduce. Or you, and then from there we can propose that change and then we go through the governance process. Or it could be like somebody came up to us because anybody can propose a fib in, file, in most of the Web3 ecosystem, right? And then, but sometimes like a seemingly innocent um, software optimization or change will carry lots of economic impact. So we get called in pretty often as a group to try to understand, oh, what is the economic um, impact of this particular change? Right, and then we also work on the new protocol design incentive. That's uh, one of the most exciting aspects of working at PL on uh, crypto econ because there are always new fundamental cryptography, distributed systems, uh, consensus research, and then it all requires some kind of um, crypto econ analysis. So we talk about scaling Filecoin, right? What if, um, this is a very common problem across Web3. What if your, your block space increases by a thousand X? Right, well, how would that change your economic incentive on the on the on the economy? We have a we have a talk about that later today. And what about um, so Filecoin the storage network? What about retrieval? What about compute over data? What about like adding more programmability? Would that create any um, issues, or can we design any new incentive to really um, stimulate the economy? And then lastly, we really believe in transparent and honest communication. A lot of our work will be uh, public uh, on GitHub on Notion. You guys can check them out as well. And then on top of that, right, I think Filecoin is um, it's a layer one protocol. We talk more about that, but we really believe in like success of the ecosystem is an extension of the economic. So for in our group, we also spend lots of time thinking about what are some of the new opportunities, the new part of market fit on the Filecoin ecosystem and even beyond, right? So, uh, but we take it, in a, we have our own approach and how we think about this problem, right? Like, I think it's very common in most of startup world about the vision, the, the storytelling, this is, uh, hey, here's what, what, what we want to achieve in the next X, Y, Z years, right? Everybody agree, that's like a grand vision. But we all know startup is hard, ideas is worthless, right? Like it's very about execution, right? So our approach really is, we do know where the frontier of the protocol is. We do know where we are right now, that's where the product market fit is, that's where all the participants are participating for, right? And then from there, we see there's a gap, right? So can we find all these like new, uh, areas, new opportunities, just at the fringes of the protocol. And then how can we find adoption and product market fit? How can we validate our ideas as quickly as we can and, uh, and as cheaply as we can as well, such that we can move uh, along the frontier and go to like the grand vision. So there are many different areas here um, that we talk uh, that we are exploring within our group and network. We don't constrain ourselves just, uh, to just crypto econ lab. We think of it as a crypto econ lab and its network. So. If you're watching this talk here or remotely, right, if you're interested in collaborating with us, feel free to reach out. But these are some of the possible idea, possible areas that we are uh, exploring. And then in, in the second half of today's uh, session, you see more of uh, our collaborators presenting their different research and project as well. So some of these include like differentiated storage services, which is talking about like Ethereum uh, migrating their storage states, right? That could be a business on the table already, right? There's novel data marketplaces, uh, retrieval markets, and different layer twos on Filecoin. Um, Self-service and user-generated analytics, as we saw earlier, there's a, there's a ton of data on Filecoin and we see more examples down the line as well. Financing and lending, NFTs and other token structures, data DAO, somebody just raised lots of money, I saw in the newsletter today, uh, on the data DAO concept, right? But I think in the Filecoin ecosystem, if you go close to the protocol, there are many uh, there are many part of PMF and adoption opportunity that you can really build lots of traction before you even attract any uh, venture investment. And I want to call one more thing. Uh, FVM is an uh, EVM compatible user defined smart contract coming on the Filecoin, right? A lot of our ecosystem are betting on like FVM, like actually uh, enabling lots of this new application to be built. But our take really is like FVM shouldn't be the bottleneck. That's just a technology, right? Like you can always find a way around it and then like um, build something that works. And then you build the traction, build the adoption. Once you have that, when FVM comes online, you will just be an easy migration. And then also branding, marketing, and also like um, how do we really um, build this adoption really matters a lot. Cool, so with that in mind, this is kind of like the, the vision for our lab, our culture, and then like what we've been working on, the two main track research, and also application and businesses uh, on top of the Filecoin network. So now we're gonna talk about some of the key economic policy, or right? talk about governance, what are we governing, right? Like what are we talking about? So I hope with this policy that give us a baseline understanding of like how Filecoin works, and then like what are the policy that we are, uh, that we are considering. So, but before that, let's just talk very briefly about Filecoin. Um, if you guys have been to my previous talk, I talk about this a lot, but I'm gonna do it again because I realize everyone came from a slightly different background. 
Um, so people always thought about Filecoin as just a storage network, but I think our, and from our last point of view, it's way more than just storage. If you think of Filecoin as a storage network, you're underselling Filecoin, underestimating the potential, right? First of all, uh, I think it's really a layer one of protocol that really starts with data, and it's designed to store a massive amounts of data, but sometimes it's, when you have massive supply, the demand may not be there yet, and that's one of the biggest challenges that our ecosystem might be facing. And then it's also a multi-sided marketplace enabled by blockchain. It's, so, it's super exciting. I think it's one of the first few blockchains on a, on a base protocol level that actually have a mission and try to achieve something and do something. It's also an island economy where people come together producing these valuable resources called distributed cloud storage with proof. And then they try to export that to the outside world. And then our goal is, is to really to bring more people onto our island and then try our product. And uh, another useful analogy that I always use is you think of it as an Airbnb for cloud services, right? You have like every miner or every storage providers on Filecoin are essentially an Airbnb host, right? They amass all these resources and then like they let people try their services, right? And, and, and it's not just storage too, it's also storage, uh, compute, and connectivity. I would argue, I think the Filecoin network is one of the, uh, in terms of like the hardware and all this like power, I think we are one of the strongest network just from a hardware perspective. Uh, in all of Web3. Um, and also, it's a very passionate research engineering product community. I think everybody's here super friendly. Really, uh, we're really trying to build something new, something different, something like um, how can we make blockchain really mainstream and useful and really deliver this kind of internet scale experience in Web3. So these are three um, illustrations. The one on the top is the Filecoin uh, gas, uh, Filecoin network fee. We implemented an EIP 1559 variant. We talk more about that, but these are all the Filecoin that were paid to the network as network fees. And then the second chart basically, a second diagram basically compare Filecoin with the, all the other storage networks out there, right? So uh, I think Dave mentioned just now, we have like 17 exabyte of capacity that is 10% of AWS today. And that is about the same size as Google Cloud in 2018. And Filecoin achieved that in just one a year and a half, which is an amazing milestone. And then the other illustration is just like uh, the different parties in this island working together. And uh, here's another way to look at this, right? Like you have the storage providers. These are different participants on the Filecoin network. You have storage providers kind of like amassing all the different resources, producing reliable and useful storage. And this is getting incentivized by the protocol. We would like to incentivize more things in a fully decentralized setting, but the other things are much harder to prove, right? We hear about, uh, we hear about some of these things that are useful, but harder to prove later today, right? And the client, clients are the storage clients, right? They store data on Filecoin. Uh, uh, today, but then very soon they can do a lot more. And then sometimes if you hear this term client, they might be a bit confusing. So uh, because Filecoin is both a blockchain, but also an Airbnb for cloud services, uh, but also like many, many, many other things, right? Um, so in this particular case, we talk about storage clients, right? They work directly with the storage providers uh, to use their storage. But you can also think of people using the blockchain as clients, right? In that, if you think about uh, people using the blockchain as clients, in that case, the storage providers are clients of the Falcon network as well. It's a bit confusing. I hope we are on the same page. Um, and then token holders can stake Falcon to facilitate more storage onboarding, capital efficiency, and then the ecosystem partner uh, uh, participating really actively in this space. Cool. Then now we can move on to the different policies. So let's talk about block reward. Um, so in 2017, like when Falcon first first announced, right, we have this like, exponential decay in the block reward curve. Um, this is pretty common practice in many Web3 projects. But as a crypto econ lab, we also observed there are quite a few incentive issues around this, right? Like the incentive is the strongest when the network is the least mature, right? You give out the most rewards in the very beginning, right? And also the reward is entirely time release, right? Time based on how much time has elapsed uh, since the beginning of the network, and and. I mean, it's actual decay. The problem here becomes like the early. Uh, there's a massive, massive like first mover advantage because just be, just because you're here early, you earn a lot more. And especially when the network is the least mature and the least secure. So then we creatively define this kind of block reward policy, which we call a baseline minting, where we define a KPI for the network. So the reward minting, uh, block reward minting on the blockchain protocol depends on how much storage is being committed to the network. It starts with, uh, I think, 2.5 exabyte, and it doubles every year. So right now, the baseline is 8 exabyte. It will double to 16 exabyte in, a, in the coming year. Um, so the blockchain, the block reward minting is only at its maximum speed when this KPI is being met, and it's being met over time. 
So this is being computed over time, like every every uh, every block, uh, every single block on the Filecoin network. And this is a software spec where our team like uh, design uh, design the system. So here are some uh, so here are some of the um, empirical numbers. The baseline was crossed in April last year, so we have, uh, we are in like full speed minting right now. So you can, as you can see, for the network block rewards, right, it's steadily increasing because we're behind the baseline. The network is cut, cutting, uh, is holding back its minting, de deferring that to the future because the network hasn't reached its KPI. But once it its KPI, we follow the uh, exponential um, de exponential decay minting curve. The next policy is a collateral policy. So this is how, kind of how Filecoin work. So you have uh, the miner coming to the network. The, the squares there are the, uh, the blockchain, right? So they acquire some token as collateral, right? They, and then they commit this capacity to the network. It's, it's, it's like a Uber network, right? It's like, hey, Filecoin, I have some spare capacity here. Here's my proof. And then like, if anybody, anybody wants to take it, come talk to me, right? It's kind of like Airbnb uh, host getting listed on the Airbnb platform. Uh, Uber drive, empty Uber drivers, dri empty Uber uh, being driven on the road, uh, picking up demand, right? And it's super important because a network or a platform economy that's always uh, at full service, there's no, in, there's not enough slack to pick up any upcoming demand. And then um, they, uh, for the miner, they, uh, they put the token into this um, capacity, or sometimes we call that like a container, and they run some compute over it, and then they commit it to the Falcon protocol, and then they start earning rewards. Um, and then later on, they can let's say when the demand really comes around, they can choose to upgrade that capacity and take client deals and earn even more rewards. Um, quite a few of us will talk more about how that works exactly later on. Um, so there are two. So the collateral does two things, right? One is uh, one part is to ensure the reliability of the storage, which turned out to be fairly reliable, and then the other one is to secure the consensus. So you can see this chart in terms of percentage of Filecoin lock as part of the uh, circulating supply, and also the total Filecoin lock over time. And, that's, uh, and then there's, uh, with the collateral, there's also slashing. So slashing happens, um, it's either you violate the consensus security of the protocol, or you basically, I told the protocol, hey, I'm committing some storage, but like my storage is not reliable. So the Falcon blockchain comes around to all the storage provider every single day and say, hey, can you show me your storage? And the provider say, hey, here you go, good. Nothing happens. But if they say, oh no, I, I might have lost the data, and then the blockchain will actually slash some of the collateral. So, so far it has been pretty reliable and then we can all see this a very clear correlation between like the faults on the Falcon network and the collateral that's being slashed from all the SPs on the network. And then also gas policy. So we implemented a variant of EIP 1559 about a year before Ethereum did. Um, and then like we make a few variations and we are con consistently making new, doing new research and making new modification to the gas policy. Um, this is like the daily gas burn on Filecoin. Um, I can go a lot more details into why this chart looks uh, the way it is, but I think for now, like, we're just gonna leave it as is. So, um, but to illustrate, right, this to illustrate Filecoin is like a layer one protocol um, as much as anything else. And next, we have this, also this very key Filecoin innovation, which is called Field Plus. It adds a layer of social trust on top of Filecoin. It also gives a lot more power and leverage to storage clients. In short, uh, for storage provider who store uh, clients, a uh, few plus clients data, they get a 10x boost to their power, which increases the chance of them earning a block reward. And then uh, the, the mission and the goal here really is to incentivize more useful storage on the Filecoin network. And uh, this program has seen a tremendous adoption in the last like few months, right? Like we actually onboard, we're actually onboarding more than one petabyte of useful data every single day. So, you're, uh, so you have about one petabyte of data being used by clients every single day. And by the way, so all the chart that I just showed you, it's all public. And that's the beauty of this. And I also realized there's so many, there's so much data on Filecoin and so many APIs, and there's so many things to explore. And then there's also create a dashboard that if you just want to like a bird's, you just want a bird's eye view of what's going on in the network, those dashboards are there as well. So next, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give a brief update of the, uh, where we are as a network, and then uh, so that people have the right context of what, what, what are the major challenges in our ecosystem, and what are the different opportunities, because whenever we have a challenge, it's always an opportunity. So uh, this is a chart that I think is a leading indicator of the Falcon Network's health. This is a chart on the new storage uh, being onboarded onto the network. You, the equivalent of this in Bitcoin is like your hash rate, right? But, uh, but this is like the delta of the hash rate in a sense. So it's how much, how much compute, how much resources are being 
newly added to the Falcon network every single day. So when we first launched the network, it was about 20 petabytes a day, right? So because maybe it's new, it's not, who knows how like, is Falcon network secured? There are many questions about the Falcon network. So our server provider is a bit more cautious and prudent in onboarding the storage. But as time goes on, oh, this network is great. We're going to add more. So people add a lot more uh, storage. And this is also being bottlenecked by the chain scalability, right? Because as I mentioned earlier, if you are a storage provider, you think of uh, Falcon blockchain, right? You are a client to the blockchain too, because you're using the blockchain to prove that you have data and you have storage. And then, it, and then the Falcon engineering team introduced um, introduced a chain, introduced a protocol improvement uh, that increased the scalability of Falcon protocol by 10 to 25x. Right, so then it unlocks even more onboarding. But then around September, some of the global, global macro climate has changed. Uh, we we then uh, then the onboarding rate has decreased since then, but in more recent months it's going up again, right? Because people feel like oh, after you hit this negative news uh, going on in the global macro environment, people feel more confident again, right? They, they onboard a lot more storage, and even with the recent market downturn, we don't see a significant decrease in the onboarding rate. People, uh, all the storage providers are still very bullish about the Falcon network. They're still adding massive amounts of data and storage to the Falcon network every single day. Um, and this is like the same chart, uh, just, uh, the chart that we showed uh, earlier about the, the daily network uh, fees that is being paid to the network for, for using it, right? So uh, we saw that with the, with the government crackdown and then like there's a dip, um, there's a dip around like earlier, uh, and last year, to, uh, the first quarter of this year, but it's steadily picking up again. So onboarding is one part. It's like the inflow of the it's like the inflow of uh, storage capacity to the Falcon network. But it's at the same time, there's also outflow. I feel like I, I hesitated because I feel like I'm getting a bit more into the details here. Um, but apologize if it's a, bit, it's a bit confusing. So so when people onboard storage, they're promising a network. Say, hey, I'm storing some data for some duration, right? So it's, there's a fixed duration over here, and this data might be expiring over time. So this is a chart that says, oh, sure, you have data being onboarded, but at the same time, some data might be expiring. So this is looking forward, uh, looking forward. So all the orange, orange bars are the potential expiration on the Falcon network. So these are data that might uh, leave the network down the line. Uh, but then all the blue bars are how much of this data being renewed, how much of this story being renewed to stick around on the Falcon network. And it makes a lot of sense because you see more renewal. Um, as we, This is where we are right now. The bright yellow are uh, in the past and the orange are going forward. Um, so you see more renewal closer to the, to the expiration date, and then that renewal rate de declines over time because it's further out in the future. We are not sure. We can make up our, I can make up my mind later as a storage provider whether I want to extend. But what this means on a token flow level is like um, when people ex when they expire the sector, there's always release of initial pledge with the collateral. So this will be another, this will be, um, so given the schedule expiration, you see this increase in liquidity in the Falcon network. And just mark the date around February, that's the first wave of uh, sector expiration. So then we also make this chart about the actual supply and demand of the Falcon token, right? Like you actually see um, uh, the, the yellow bar here is when you spell the X axis, that means that it's being removed from the circulating sub, uh, sorry. This chart is on the lock file coin. When it's above the X axis, it means that you're locking more file coin. When it's below the X axis, it means that you are releasing more file coin, right? So you see that uh, for onboarding for initial pledge, right, it's always above the X axis. It's only when expiration happens, it starts to go below the X axis. But in recent months, we did see lots of positive growth where the increase in where, where the initial pledge is making up a bigger proportion of, of the lock file coin. Again, I think it's too much in the weeds. Uh, <laughs> uh, but and this is being attributed to strong adoption of Filecoin Plus, where given this chart, where you have like more than one petabyte of Filecoin being used every day, and the clients lock more collateral as well, it actually brings back the circulating supply. Uh, but to summarize, what I'm trying to say from the state of network really is this, uh, gi even given the macro downturn, all this headwind coming our way, we still see very strong health uh, in terms of storage onboarding. We see lots of adoption with like, with Filecoin Plus, and then if looking at the token supply and demand, this is, even though times are hard, but I think like it's still moving in the upward direction. Uh, well, lastly, to close it off, uh, we're gonna talk about, the, I think like we, I mentioned many, many things like in passing, there are many other uh, speakers today we go through in greater details about gas, about circulating supply, about different kinds of application and businesses that you can build on Filecoin, and, and so on and so forth, and also for, 
Uh, we are hosting two more Crypto Econ Day after today. Today is our second time hosting Crypto Econ Day uh, in Austin. We're super excited to be here. We are hosting two more, one in FCC in Paris in July. If you guys are going to be there, let us know. We'd like to have you back. And uh, we're hosting another one in Singapore in August.